helping us today. It does look like um, we have about 18% from federal DOT, about 45% from state DOT, 5% from local um, transportation departments, 5% from public lands agencies, and about 5% from other federal, state, or local agencies, um, as well as 9% from educational institutions and 9% from private consultants. So we have a pretty big variety for today's webinar. As far as where everyone is joining us from, we have about 9% from the Northeast, 17% from the Southeast, 17% from the Midwest, 48% from the West, and 9% from other. I am going to go ahead and move us over to our presentation screen now. Today's webinar, just to go through a few logistics for us, is going to be about an hour and a half long. The webinar is being recorded and will be archived on the Rural Safety Center's website. For quality of this recording, all phone lines other than our presenters have been muted. If you are listening on the phone, we would ask you to please mute your computer. If you do have any audio issues, um, we would suggest please calling in via phone. The phone number can be found in the top left-hand corner of your screen. It is an 866 number. During the presentation today, there will be a lot of graphics. If you're interested in making the PowerPoint itself full screen, you can um, hit the, the window box in the top right-hand corner of the presentation. Um, in the top of our PowerPoint right now, you'll see an example of what that looks like. That will make um, the PowerPoint itself full screen and hide all of the uh, other information around the outside for you. At the end of each section, of which there will be three today, there will be time for question and answers with our presenters. Um, and we will also have a poll question for our audience. We also want to direct you to the handout pod that is in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Um, there you will be able to find a PDF version of today's slides if you would like to download those. They will also be available after the webinar on our website with the audio recording. We also do want to ask if you wouldn't mind to please complete the follow-up surveys. Uh, they are vital for us assessing our webinar qualities. In addition, the one that will be sent directly following today's webinar is the one in which you can request um, certificates of uh, education units from the Montana State University. Um, just in case the survey does not come to your email, sometimes it does get caught in those junk filters. We now have the survey link shown on the screen. And again, it is available in that PDF handout as well in case you do need to fill it out using the link. The survey will close within two weeks after the webinar. And you can expect the certificate and the form to request your CEUs four to six weeks after the webinar. The CEU form needs to be filled out and returned to continuing ed at montana.edu and not the safety center as those are um, through a different department at Montana State University. You can also request a verification of completion form. So on the left-hand side now, you'll see the, the registration form. And on the right-hand side, if you ever requested a verification form, it would show you all of the different activities that you have requested CEUs from the Rural Safety Center, uh, as well as how many you have attained. So this would include any webinars that we've done in the past, as well as our three summits. For today, we are um, excited to have two speakers, guest speakers, with us. The first that we have is Rob Ament. Rob is the Road Ecology Program Manager for the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University, Bozeman. He is the principal investigator for this roads project. And at WTI, he leads a group of research ecologists and engineers that provide solutions to reduce the ecological impacts of transport infrastructure on nature. In addition, we have Matt Bell joining us. He is a research engineer at WTI as well. He has his Master of Science in Transportation Engineering with his Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Biology. His understanding of wildlife ecology makes him a valuable asset to WTI's road ecology program. He joined WTI in 2019 as a research engineer. And in addition to the roads analysis, anal and 
analyzes the feasibility of using new materials such as fiber reinforced polymer wildlife crossing infrastructure and roadside wool erosion control blankets, as well as the performance of Montana bridges to deterioration. So we're very excited to have the two of them today discussing their new project. The goal for today's webinar is that once you've completed it, you will have an understanding of the recently completed phase three of an animal vehicle collision data collection system called ROADS, or Roadkill Observation and Data System. To achieve the webinar goal today, you will learn to characterize the need for a Department of Interior-wide Animal Vehicle Collection Data Collection System, describe the three phases of the project, identify how simple it is to use the road survey on a mobile device and the information that is gathered, demonstrate how the data collected through the road system can be analyzed and presented in reports, and lastly, to discover ways to get involved in efforts to co-develop the National Animal Vehicle Collision Data Collection Standards. So at this time, I'm very excited to hand over our webinar to Rob Amit. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today. And I want to thank the Rural Road Center for hosting this webinar and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and the National Park Service for jointly uh, pursuing the development of this data collection system called ROADS. And, um, so I'm going to start moving through my slides. I have a couple terms that I would like to clarify. Um, uh, first of all, that we um, talk about wildlife vehicle collisions and animal vehicle collisions. Uh, and we're primarily using AVC. When we started the first phase of this project, it was focused on wildlife vehicle collisions but subsequently has added uh, the collection of domestic animals, particularly livestock or large uh, domestic animals uh, for data collection purposes. Uh, and given many federal land management agencies have um, livestock allotments, grazing allotments, or open range, uh, collecting both wildlife and domestic uh, made sense uh, as we develop uh, the system. Uh, the second is, uh, originally, the system was set up to just collect carcasses or dead animals uh, along roads. But uh, again, during uh, earlier phases, it was thought wise to also collect information on where uh, live wildlife uh, were crossing or uh, located or near and adjacent to roads. So sometimes one uh, would want to mitigate a road where, for example, migrations occur and animals are safely crossing it, and you might want to set up a, a variable message sign during the migration. So it's able to collect both live and, and dead animals. And this is just from the national study uh, over a decade now ago, but on average, uh, there are about one to two million collisions with large mammals, uh, causing many thousands, tens of thousands of human injuries on and 200, on average, 200 human fatalities a year. But from that, but from that study, I had also found that two-lane roads is where primarily uh, ABCs occur, and of course, on federal uh, lands, that's uh, 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 primarily the roads that uh, you're managing. Uh, another a data point uh, that leads to the need for collecting animal vehicle collision data is that, uh, again, this is wildlife. Wildlife vehicle collisions account for over 10% of all crashes, uh, according to the study in 2019. And that's about twice the national average. So uh, AVCs are uh, an issue that's of more import on federal lands than on your average uh, rural highway. And then uh, about five years ago, both uh, the National Park Service and the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, completed their national long-range transportation plans. And in both plans, uh, they did ident identify the, the need to um, address wildlife vehicle collisions uh, and to locate where those uh, collisions were occurring. So again, this all leads to the notion of, or the importance of developing 
a consistent uh, um, agency-wide uh, data collection system. And given the National Park Service has over 400 management units, uh, and the Fish and Wildlife Service have over 500, uh, having a, uh, a system that everyone can use across nearly 1,000 management units nationwide was deemed a very important uh, um, system to pursue. And so that's why, in essence, we've uh, been asked to develop this in, in collaboration with the two agencies. And so that was their brilliant idea, is to collect, have one system that could work uh, for both agencies and other federal land management agencies and potentially partners. So we looked into all three uh, other agencies, meaning the Bureau of Land Management, for example, and other Department of Interior federal land management agencies. We looked into partners such as tribal use and um, uh, also NGOs or nonprofit organizations to co collect data. And then we also looked outside of those partners as well that may not have the same kind of system that we developed uh, roads on. And I'll get to that right now. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about the potential ways to use the ABC data that the, the two agencies were very interested in. One was to identify important mitigation sites. Others was for live, live data collection to think about where uh, wildlife were moving across the road systems. Also to support planning, not only the national LRTP or the uh, national plans, but also regional plans also for management units for their programming and budgeting decisions. They wanted to make sure the system could uh, quantify mortality rates, particularly species of conservation concern, uh, if that a system that could also support research projects uh, looking at roads or looking at the conservation of species. And lastly, uh, to work with partners to inform, have information and data that could inform regional conservation efforts or driver safety initiatives and education campaigns. So the first two phases, which we will only bring forward a couple ideas from that in today's presentation, uh, explore different platforms to host uh, roads to actually develop the, the road system on. And uh, after we went through a, a very uh, broad review of all these different apps, as it were, that collected uh, road killer wildlife information, we settled on ESRI's ArcGIS. Uh, in phase one and two, we also created the actual data collection survey. Uh, or the data form that collects uh, the information at each site. Uh, it uh, also began to develop with partners national WBC data standards so that uh, if, uh, when the Fish and Wildlife Service and National Park Service were collecting their information, it could be readily shared because other partners were collecting uh, very similar types of data with the same kind of standards. And then last of all was to actually go out in the field and have people use the survey uh, and to improve it uh, through an iterative process over the course of the, the first two phases as well as this third phase. And to just give you an idea, we actually did look at all kinds of different commercial and, and freeware uh, to uh, develop the road system on. And uh, ultimately, at the end of the day, we selected ESRI. And uh, the reason is uh, all of the Department of Interior agencies already have a license for ArcGIS online. And along with our, that ArcGIS system, uh, they had a mobile app uh, to collect um, uh, information. And it's, the application is called Survey123. So already uh, working across all the Department of Interior agencies with the system they already had. So they had IT uh, familiarity and support with this system. And that's ultimately why we selected 
ESRI's ArcGIS and its Survey 123 to develop the road system. And when we talk about the road survey today, what we mean is the program questionnaire or form, data form, to collect the roadside observations of both carcasses and live wildlife and then other related site attributes. So that's all collected on Survey 123. So uh, it may be a little bit confusing, but uh, it is uh, the system as set up by ESRI that we're operating on. And so for phase three, uh, we wanted to continue to develop national standards with partners. Uh, we'll talk about some of the results of two different national workshops in that regard. Uh, we wanted to create a user's manual that supports uh, the biologists or the employees of the agencies in the field when they're using roads, the road survey. We also didn't want to foreclose possibilities of moving it after research and development on the ESRI system to other platforms. Uh, and then we also wanted to determine if uh, other DOI partners would be interested in using the road surveys that the two agencies uh, developed. And last, we wanted to do one final beta test uh, with our final survey uh, and update any last uh, glitches that might occur so that it's basically a system that uh, is ready for use. And then the last thing is a final report, which we're drafting right now and uh, provide this webinar to share our results with uh, folks on the phase three. So that's uh, sort of a summary of where we're headed, and I believe the next presentation will be with Matt Bell, who will actually talk about the data collection component of the road system. Perfect. Thank you very much. And at this point in time, we are going to stop and see if we have any questions. Um, if you do have any questions for our presenter, you can go ahead and add those to the chat pod, and we will ask those. In addition, we have a, two poll questions for you. The first is, why was a DOI or Department of Interior-wide animal vehicle collection Hello? data collection system needed? Is it because there's one to two million collisions with large mammals per year? Because animal vehicle collisions lead to 200 human fatalities per year? Detailed animal vehicle collision data can inform data-driven safety analysis, analysis and planning decisions or NPS and Fish Wildlife's long-range transportation plans specifically mention planning for ABCs, or all of the above. And then in addition, for the Rural Safety Center, if you've joined our webinars before, what we do ask is that for each section of our webinar, um, you jot down what is one action item you'd consider implementing in your jurisdiction based on what you've heard. So if there's anything that has jumped to mind so far, um, we would suggest you write that down on a piece of paper at your desk. And if you'd like to share that with us as well in the open-ended um, chat pod, we would, uh, would love that as well. We'll give everyone just another minute to answer those poll questions, and then we'll check the chat pod and see if we have any questions so far for our presenters. Okay, so at this point in time, Rob, we have the poll closed. I believe you should be able to see it on your end. If not, please let me know. Sorry, Jamie, I, um, I lost connectivity for the last several minutes, and I'm just back on. So if you okay, had asked me no any problem. questions, I'm afraid I don't know what, uh, what you did. Sure, no, no problem whatsoever. So it looks like everybody, 100% of you, got the correct answer for our poll question. And why was a DOI um, animal vehicle collision data collection system needed? The answer was all of the above. So great job with that, everybody. And it doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat pod yet. So I am going to go ahead and move us over 
to our presentation again and hand it over to Matt at this time. Hi, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go over briefly the general uh, process used to collect data, how the data is filtered through ESRI, and also the data survey that we have and the questions that we have ended up with currently. <clears throat> so as Rob mentioned earlier, we developed this, pro, uh, this survey on ESRI, ArcGIS, and within Survey123. And ArcGIS Survey123 can create, share, and analyze surveys. They collect data via web or mobile devices. Um, and they can even do this when it is not connected to the internet. It'll save your, your data fields, and then they can be uploaded using either your mobile device's data or once it's connected to Wi-Fi again. And the Survey123 allows users to analyze results quickly and upload data securely for further analysis. And ever since we started this, many organizations have switched to Survey123 platform because of the simplicity and the wide range use of the system. Uh, and even in the last two years since we've contacted people, they have switched a lot of their surveys to Survey123 for its widespread use. So I just wanted to give a quick overview of kind of how the road survey operates. Um, I think I can use a pointer. So it starts here with the survey one, two, three, and that is the road survey. So once you enter data, it goes to the Esri cloud, which would be table A. And that is your general basic information that you have collected. And currently, the road system is hosted at the Montana State University system, uh, ESRI account, um, for research purposes. Long-term goals are to move that outside of Montana State University so uh, other organizations can have control of that. Um, but the way it is set up currently is that, so once you have data in Table A, we do post-data processing of additional information that goes to Table B. And this information is, can be auto-filled from the user's account information, which could include their name or their ID number, uh, work email, or the type of staff that they are, either if they're like a biologist, maintenance worker, law enforcement, um, just to add additional data fields to each observation. In addition to this, they do uh, spatial analyses related based on the lat-long points added or collected in the survey data. And then this data is used, or that, those locations are used to identify what federally land managed area region it is in, um, the management unit, state, county, township. Um, and then there's also line analyses. And these are based more on the quality of data within national park and federally managed lands, um, but then we can extract uh, the road functional class, uh, number of lanes, posted speed limit. And so there are 11 additional observation sites or op uh, data points added that go into table B. And then from that point, managers of the road survey within your organization can review data, and then it would move to table C. And this kind of is for the purposes of allowing certain data not to be viewed by um, generally the public and specifically talking about threatened and endangered species locations that the agencies want to keep private. And so there's 11 additional fields added to roads, but the survey consists of 11 data fields as well. Eight of them are mandatory. Uh, one is automatic, and that is date and time. And there's two optional, which are the geosync photo and the comments. And I will be going through all the questions briefly just to discuss why they're there. Before we get started, 
The first safety feature added to the survey is the addition of a safety warning that appears at the top of the survey. So it is visible every time it is open to record an observation. For Fish, Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service partners adopting roads, this warning is used as a legal agreement between the organization hosting the survey and the volunteers that are collecting data for the organization. It is now a standardized thing for warning all users to always use the road survey safely. So the first data field that is uh, entered is the observed animal location. So one of the most important variables in wildlife vehicle collision data is the accuracy of GPS locations for the collected information. The built-in map is able to record observation locations in the accuracy of your mobile device, and that's normally within plus or minus three meters when you have clear skies and terrain. Uh, it can vary based on topography and other things like that. The target icon right there um, is the second safety feature added. Uh, a user can click on this button and it will lock the, on their location. This allows them to lock the location and then retreat to a safe location to complete the rest of the survey. Or if your passenger is in the car when you're driving by the location, they can push the button and lock the location and continue to enter the information as they go. And this is so users, uh, and you can also click on the map and move the observation point if you are not able to stop or collect the data near the animal. And this allows you also to pull over to a safe spot, lock in your location, and fill in the rest of the data. The second data field is the observation date and time. The observation, uh, it is automatically saved once a location in the map is saved. If a user is ent entering this data at a later date or time, they're able to click on the data field and manually enter when they saw the observation. And the third data field is the photos. And this is not required field to be entered for the data to be saved uh, or for the survey to be saved. And this is because it may be impossible to approach the animal for a picture or a picture would be useless if an animal is unrecognizable after a collision. However, pictures are extremely important for unexperienced users and users that are collecting data on threatened and endangered species. These photos allow managers to go in and review the collision to ensure the correct information is recorded for each observation. And for example, um, if a user collects data and says it's a lynx, a manager is allowed to go in there, look at the pictures, and actually they might identify that it was a bobcat, not a lynx. So it's very important for um, the quality of the data. So originally during phase one of the project, we had a list of every animal in the lower 48 states by common name, common and scientific names. And this led to a timely process to enter the animal species information into the survey. So for the phase three part, we shortened the list to 21 most common species involved in AVCs in the US. Um, and in addition to this, we added four different fields um, for uh, other other mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, or livestock. And this allows the observer to go in there to identify species that are not on the list or if it's just a completely unknown species that is non-recognizable. But you might be able to see that it was a reptile or an amphibian or a bird. The fifth data field, this is an important field because it gives managers of roads a starting point to where they should start to review data as the user's confidence in species identification. 
Managers can filter data by medium and low confidence in species identification to ensure all observations were entered correctly. And in general, the WTI research team suggests that a user click the high confidence button if they are over 90% sure the animal that they are observing is the correct species. Uh, data field six, the number of animals observed. This allows users to only have to enter an observation once if there are multiple an animals of the same species, location, and status. And so if, if any of these are different, the, the species, the location, or the status, then multiple observations need to be entered. For example, a, an alive elk next to the road where there is also a dead elk in the road would require two different observations to be entered. But if you just see 10 elk along the side of the road, that would only require one. So data field seven is the animal status. And many AVC data collection systems are only able to collect information about dead animals. And that's one unique feature about this one, as Rob mentioned earlier is that it can collect spatially precise information about alive animals attempting to cross or using habitat near the road. And this is important information when trying to interpret AVC data that is commonly left out. Identifying where animals may be crossing the road successfully can lead to better mitigation strategies and analysis methods. So data field eight is the animal's conservation status. And this is an important field that was required by the National Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service. The location of threatened and endangered species is considered sensitive information and should only be accessed by individuals with the proper clearance. Marking an observation as threatened or endangered or unknown automatically flags it so it can be reviewed by managers and none of the information will be sent to table C to be viewed by the road general users. Data field nine is the user's affiliation. <clears throat> this is another important data field that was deemed important by NPS and FWS. The long-term goal is to have roads used by multiple organizations such as uh, DOI agencies and bureaus, other federally land managed areas, states and local agencies, tribes, NGOs, and even citizen scientists. And so this data field rec records the observer's affiliation to allow roads managers to access the database and sort it to only include what their agency collected or quickly identify which observations may require review if they're using data not collected by their agency employees or partners. And data field 10 is the purpose of observation. This field was added to the survey because we are not currently able to add a route tracking function seamlessly into the current road survey. A route tracking function is important because it allows users to record their monitoring effort. That function would allow researchers to have more information about ABC data and be able to make the correct assumptions between opportunistic and systematic ABC data collection. So this question allows users to identify where or how the observation uh, uh, is collected and where it's from. There are six different uh, options uh, random opportunity, crash information, carcass removal, monitoring program, research project, or other. And so if a user selects any of the latter three choices, a text box will appear and allow them to enter the name of their program or project. This allows agencies to add unique identifiers for their project, so it is e easily filtered um, to analyze the data using the appropriate assumptions that affect interpretation of the data set or subsets of data. This allows users to identify different research projects so observations can be filtered by projects or to help managers understand why observations may be higher along a road section. 
For example, if salamander fatalities are the focus of a research project, then other species killed along the road may not be recorded. And then the last one is just comments, and this just allows any user to enter any additional information to the observation that can help managers interpret or understand the data. If there was a mountain lion and an elk killed in the same crash, possibly, or any weird aspects of it, um, threatened and endangered species, maybe you want to say a little more about it, anything like that but also not required, so um, it doesn't need to be entered. And so that covers the data fields in the road survey, and then it all is uploaded to the ArcGIS website, and you are allowed to view the data in Map Viewer. And this kind of is the general layout of the map. Um, these are data points from our beta test this past year. And this is a very user-friendly map of viewing service. And you can do a lot of different things within this, saving different maps, downloading data, um, filters, and everything. So moving on to the next one to give a couple examples. So some map, uh, map features, you can change the style of the points. So on the left, you can see the normal just points. They're all just the same color, same shape. Um, but then you can alter it and do densities to make heat maps. The heat maps are just a visual interpretation. They are not an analysis. They, you can determine the density of the heat maps on a sliding bar scale within the map. So this is a very good function for reports and other things like that to kind of show and highlight where a majority of collisions are happening along road segments. And uh, this road segment, for example, is just south of Montana in the Idaho-Wyoming border, south of Yellowstone. Uh, you can also change it, on, like on the far right, uh, temporal patterns. So this is identified by date. And the darker the date, the later in the year that it was collected. Um, that's just for this example, not always. You can set it up colors and shades the way you like them to be. Some other useful styles to look at your data, you can do it by any uh, data field within the survey. So on the left, you'll see the animal status. And so those are divided by dead, alive crossing the road, and alive next to the road. Uh, the red points are the dead animals. And I cannot remember which the yellow and green are, but the yellow and green are the alive observations that were collected along this road, and that's south of Livingston, north of Yellowstone National Park in Paradise Valley. And in the middle one, you can see they're divided by species, and you can just kind of start to see how and where animals are occurring. And just from this, the, the red dots in the middle one are elk, and you can just see that those are a lot prevalent as you get closer near the park down south in the valley. And then on the right, it's done by the number of animals observed. So this kind of just helps to see that some of these large circles on there have 20 to 50 observations in them. And I think there's one that was even almost to 100 where there was a herd of elk next to the road that they were collecting data for. And just some additional map features. You can change the base map and the layers how you want. Like we were saying earlier in the post-data processing, there has been layers added to our system to have be able to do spatial analyses on uh, different road properties or environmental properties in the area. Um, the ARC, uh, ArcGIS Map Viewer also allows for some spatial analysis, different spatial analyses. This, it's kind of hard to see. The points are kind of light, but here is the hotter spot of the location with between 90 and 70 percent confidence, and these are the colder spots of this road segment with also 90 to 70 percent confidence. 
And then there's this a simple uh, cluster analysis that groups them within a distance, kind of similar to the heat map, but just a little more visual with dots uh, ranging in different sizes. And so for our beta test, we have also created a user's manual because ArcGIS or ESRI's ArcGIS Survey123 is a international system used around the world. They have all the information that you would need to do anything within any of these systems. But we created a simple about 20-page document that covers all the steps required for either another department or agency or an NGO to use the roads template and install it on their own Esri account system. So it's divided into three chapters. And the first chapter um, explains how to create different groups and how to edit the survey to fit your need. Um, Rob will talk about it in a second, but there's a desert tortoise uh, project going on where they have added a couple questions, and they've added the tortoise to their species list to make it easier for them to use. Um, in creating groups, um, for example, if this was an agency-wide application, you can do it in many ways. You could just do one system for, or one group for all national parks, or you could divide it up by states, or you could divide it up by parks. There's a number of different ways that you can create groups and have people join them uh, to collect data. The fewer number of groups that are used within an agency, the more ex data that is accessible to everyone. And that's only to the managers that have ex access to it. So it kind of depends on how someone wants to set it up. If Yellowstone National Park doesn't care that Glacier National Park has some of their data, then it can be just made together by state or nationwide. The second chapter deals with how to install the road survey and survey one and survey one two three onto your mobile device for collecting data. And it also has different data collection tips, as you can see on the right, of just kind of things we're looking for and kind of like explaining for example the photo. Um, if you're having trouble identifying something, it's important to take a picture that would help the managers identify it as well. Like if it was the rump of a deer to tell the difference between a whitetail and a mule, or the rack of a buck to see the differences. Those type of things are very valuable when it comes to the managers looking at the picture. So a quality picture is very useful. And then the third chapter just goes over the general use of ArcGIS Map Viewer and different analyses and ways to present it. In addition to this, it also explains how to export your data. So you can export the data into an Excel file, and that has all the data fields within the survey, all the post-process data fields, as well as the lat long locations. So you can export it and do any type of analysis on any other application that you commonly use for other um, analyses. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. So again, at this time, if you do have any questions to direct to either of our um, instructors, you can put them over on the left-hand side in the chat box. And we also do have a poll break, another poll question for you. So I'm going to switch us over to that real quick. Again, that chat box is still on the left-hand side. So our next question for you is, which of the following are the built-in safety features of the Roads app? A user safety warning screen, the ability to pin the observation site and move to a safe location to record additional data, a geosynced photo, A and B, or A, B, and C, or no vote. And then again, we're wondering if from this section of the webinar, there's one action item you'd consider implementing in your jurisdiction. And again, we would encourage you to write those down at your desk. And if you'd like to share them with us in this chat, chat pod, we would love to see some of those answers as well. We'll give everyone just a second, and then we'll 
uh, respond to the poll questions and then answer those questions that are coming in through the chat pod. Okay, Matt, I've gone ahead and closed the poll. So I think at this time you should be able to see the answers if you'd like to address those. Yeah, it looks like a majority of people collected, selected A, B, and C. Um, it is A and B only. Uh, C, the geosync photo is for management purposes, not necessarily a safety feature. Um, but the ability to pin observation and move away to a safe location and the safety warning to continually remind users uh, to use the road survey properly and abide by all road rules and regulations. Perfect. And we did have a few questions come in for you. The very first one is, is ESRI Survey 123 for ArcGIS and the rest of the system available outside of the United States? Uh, yes. It, it, I know it's usable, and I'm sure other organizations can get it. From what I know, it is worldwide, and uh, they do require, require subscriptions, and NGOs get uh, five free accounts, uh, and they have to pay if they want more than five. Um, but yes, you can use this across the world. And Rob actually collected some data points, I think, when he was in Kenya with our survey. So I excluded him from the map because it would have made the map really small. But there's a couple points over there that he just collected on his phone. And when he got back to Wi-Fi, sent him in and never had to use international data or anything. Perfect. And the next question that came in for you is whether or not you could upload the user's manual to the handouts pod. Um, I'm not sure if the user's manual is something that's ready um, to go out yet. Is Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We are in the final, we're submitting it within the week probably of the final draft. And once that's cleared by our t uh, technical advisory committee, it will be available. Um, I'm not sure if I'm sure she could send out a link or something, but it will be available on the WTI website and possibly the Road Safety Center. I'm not sure about that one, though. Perfect. So yes, so we at the Rural Safety Center, we will upload it as well, along with the recording of this once that manual is available. Um, but Jordan, as well, at the very end of today's webinar, there will be a um, a slide that shows emails where you can contact us as well. So if you can't find those links, um, or if you'd prefer us to email you directly, you can just send a quick email to um, Rob, Matt, or myself, and we'll make sure that you get that when it is finalized and available to you. And so it, oh, it looks like one more just came in, Matt. So it says, um, an action item idea for you is to look at adding live animal obser observations into our agency's roadkill data collection efforts. Um, yes, I I completely agree. That's that's why we added the feature into this one because we saw the value in how observing live animals could do it. There was um, you saw a lot of live animal observations in the Paradise Valley data. Um, it wasn't collected often by our beta testers, and the main reason people said they didn't use it is because they were beta testing and a lot of times they would just use the survey on their way to and from work. And one of the individuals, um, the one who collected along the Idaho-Wyoming border, um, that's a mule deer migration route. And he kind of said, I would be there all day if I was going to observe or collect everyone. Um, but yeah, I agree that super valuable. And I think that should be collected by uh, all agencies, but we do understand the time constraint, so that's why we wanted to do try to streamline it in some way with this survey. And I believe that that was one of the answers as well to our um, action items for the potential agencies that are listening to, listening today. So I think that's a, a great one to add. Um, and and as Matt said, that this system has been used and tested for that as well. So that's fantastic. Um, so I am going to. 
move us over to Rob. He's going to close out the webinar. But Rob, we did have some suggestions at the beginning when you were speaking that it was a little hard to hear you. So could you um, just do a sound check first so we can test and make sure um, there was some, some want for you to turn your volume up a bit? OK, I did turn up my volume. Is this better? Uh, that sounds a little bit better, but again, if, if anyone has issues hearing him, let us know, and I will stop Rob and ask him to um, to reconfigure. So go ahead, Rob. All right, I'll speak a, l a little bit um, louder. Uh, I have a headset on. So um, uh, the last portion of our presentation is talk about um, the road survey and how others could use it. So Matt presented primarily how uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, National Park Service, and DOI uh, bureaus and agencies uh, could use the road survey. Uh, but th the two agencies are very smart to think about other people using the road survey. And because we uh, uh, have developed this on the ESRI ArcGIS uh, platform, uh, it's a very commonly used platform by many of the uh, of the partner partner organizations and I'll talk a little bit about that so what we did uh, is we worked with uh, some NGOs to see if they would like to who had ArcGIS uh, if they would like to adopt the the road survey as developed by Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service so uh, they could just take the actual survey and put it onto their licensed, uh, their online ArcGIS system uh, they have a license for. So uh, we had the following partners as listed here actually use uh, the road survey. Our team did have to adjust sometimes the species list for them. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, for the volunteers doing the desert tortoise, uh, data collection, they wanted additional data fields added to the survey. So uh, both the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes and the Blackfeet Nation uh, wildlife agencies uh, have used uh, the road survey. So uh, the map you're seeing on this image is actually from uh, it's US 93 uh, on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes. Well, it's the Flathead Reservation in western Montana. And they collected quite a bit of data uh, going up and down the road, their, their wildlife personnel did. Uh, in the upper Yellowstone Valley, it was actually uh, conservation groups and their volunteers who collected the data that Matt showed you previously. Uh, there's also an effort in the Gallatin Valley uh, on US Highway 191, another highway uh, that leads to the West Yellowstone or the west entrance to Yellowstone National Park. And then lastly, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife refuge, Refuges of Nevada have a, a volunteer group, uh, an NGO that's collecting data for their efforts on that species. So what we found was if, if an organization did have ArcGIS, it was very easy for them to just take the survey and put it onto their system. So their data stays on their uh, server, uh, but it can all be shared. So same with uh, the DOI agencies. If you know that uh, someone's using the identical road survey, it just will facilitate the ease of di uh, different jurisdictions, but everyone collecting uh, at least the, the 11 standard uh, data fields, and they might have additional ones, but that's OK. Uh, all the fundamental information will be the same. And uh, this is what Matt alluded to. It wasn't Kenya, but we actually set up an NGO uh, in India to collect information. Of course, they have a very different species list, elephants and tigers and rhinos. Uh, but they're having a road that's uh, being uh, expanded from a two-lane to a four-lane that runs all the way along the boundary of Kazaranga National Park. And uh, so they were also interested in live crossings as well as uh, roadkill sites. Because once it becomes four lanes, they think that the live crossing sites, the successful crossing sites, may also need to be mitigated. 
And then uh, this is another really good idea by Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service. If you didn't have uh, uh, ESB's ARC Info GIS system, uh, then uh, there might be other ways to be collecting the same information on totally different uh, ABC data collection systems. And to do that, they thought the wisest path was to uh, actually develop national standards. So make sure that you have spatially accurate data using uh, a GPS system rather than paper systems that might collect by mile marker. Uh, so things like uh, agreeing that regardless of your data collection system, that you were collecting similar data. And so we hosted two, two webinars at the Transportation Re Research Board's annual meeting. Uh, the first one had about 45 attendees. That was uh, two years ago when you could actually meet in person. And then this uh, last January, we actually did it virtual. And uh, 14 different organizations helped plan this. So there is a lot of interest in developing these national standards. And the two agencies have, have uh, really created the momentum to be holding uh, these workshops. Over 120 people showed up at this last workshop. And now there's a call for uh, either the summer meeting uh, at, of TRB or next year's annual meeting to, again, keep working on these national wildlife standard, uh, data collection standards. So uh, we thought that was a very positive outcome of phase three. And then this is the very end of phase three uh, with this webinar. And so the next steps, is basically the system's uh, been tested. Uh, it's uh, very easy to use. It has safety features. And so we believe it's ready to actually go, uh, and as well as the Technical Advisory Committee, is ready to go from our research, it's, uh, the system sits on MSU's uh, servers right now, and hopefully after this phase uh, is concluded, the next step would be to move it from the MSU servers to the Department of Interior. And so uh, as part of phase three, we looked at where that, uh, where that platform sits behind the agency's firewalls, and it's called GeoPlatform. It's the Department of Interior wide platform. It could host the ESRI ArcGIS uh, system. And um, they have IT team, uh, an IT personnel that could support it. And so uh, for its long-term use, it's recommended that that's where it be moved uh, after this research and development is completed. Um, then the user's manual, I know there was a little discussion earlier about that. Right now, it's been written as if the system sits on the MSU server uh, for the beta test. And so actually, when it gets moved behind uh, the Department of Interior's firewalls and in their security system, we'll have to upgrade that user's manual for uh, employees of DOI agencies. And then it'll need some training support uh, and user support as well. And then lastly, the next step would be to continue with, with the interest uh, that has been generated so far to continue uh, SWS and MPS to co-develop national ABC standards. So basically, the system's ready to go live. We just have to move it um, and make sure it's supported by staff at the Department of Interior. And the systems we've set up for uh, your, the partner organizations, they're continuing to use it. So uh, they have their own ArcGIS. They have the survey. And their people are out uh, collecting it. Even though our phase three is ending, they're continuing uh, to gather data. So that's exactly where we are right now. Uh, the system's ready to go. It's, about, it's, it's moving day, hopefully, in the near future and uh, with the proper support for its long-term deployment uh, for DOI agencies, and as well as sharing with the, uh, its partner, continue to share with willing partners. Uh, the other last point I'd like to make is there are other state DOTs that are developing uh, parallel to roads 
uh, a system on as our GIS system as well using Survey123. I know the Arizona DOT and Fish and Game use it. Uh, Idaho is developing it. Uh, both their DOT and Fish and Game Agency are co-developing it uh, on ArcGIS. So uh, different states are using the same platform. So I think in the future this, uh, because Esri so widely uh, used and licensed that um, there, there, it, it facilitates the sharing as long as people are collecting the, using the same data fields and collecting similar or very similar information. So with that, I conclude the presentation for phase three uh, and uh, would uh, entertain any questions. Rob, I just have one thing. I have one thing to add that uh, we forgot to mention. Just um, Currently, it, this, we have set it up for tables A, B, and C. This is developed for the DOI agencies, and this will be available when it is transferred to GEO platform. Um, we do plan to uh, have the survey, road survey, available on our website, on the WTI website in the future. Um, so NGOs and other organizations can just use the survey template and download the user manual to understand how they can put it on their platform. But uh, they will not have access to tables B and C. It will not do post data processing, and it won't do the review aspect. So all data will be available to the users that are given privileges to view data. It won't have the additional processing steps, and that's just kind of the way it's currently set up for the NGOs. And this just makes it more flexible so less things can get interrupted if someone does change questions or species lists, it won't affect the process and alter all the different tables. So it just stops at table A, and it only allows access to whoever is given it. Um, a little bit of a, a less security issue, but that is it is a less security issue for NGOs and other people who are just using it for certain purposes or DOTs or whatever. But just wanted to clarify that if anyone downloads it in the future and is looking for the post-process data or reviewed t &E species. But yeah. And so before we actually go to the next poll break, um, if there are any additional questions, you can put them in the chat pod on the left. But Matt, that does um, transition into the question that came in already. So I'm going to ask that. And that, uh, you guys can decide, Rob or um, Matt, if you'd like to address it. But the question is, if the system exists behind the DOI firewall, how is it accessible to partners outside of DOI? Uh, yeah. So um, that, go, uh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rob. You go. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. I, so basically, the system is was developed for the DOI and in long term will be behind their firewall. But it'll be available for other people to install onto their Esri accounts. For example, if the DOI, it goes DOI-wide, and all agencies have it, they have all their groups set up, uh, uh, MDT, Montana Department of Transportation, could use this survey as their data collection method and have it available. And it will only be available for MDT, but if they ever need to share data, they can easily export it, and it'll be the same data. Obviously, questions can be altered, but the general information and main data questions will be there still. So um, it will be available for other organizations uh, outside of the DOI firewall. But if you're using it within the DOI firewall, you will be required to have a uh, user account from your agency to access it. Whereas if you an NGO developed it, they can invite a private or um, the general public to help them collect data if the user has an account with Esri. Um, so there, the DOI will be more have more security, um, but it will also be available for other organizations. They just won't be linked together. Perfect. Thank you. And I, I do believe that you'll be able to answer this question again, because the poll question that we have um, is true or false, only Fish, Wildlife, and National Park Service employees will be able to use roads when it becomes operational on Department of Interior servers. True or false? And so we'll give everyone just a second, and then um, 
there is some disagreement going on for this question. So Rob, when you answer that, we'll, um, we'll let you clear up those. And then again, our very last uh, section for you from this section of the webinar, what is one action item you'd consider implementing in your jurisdiction? Um, again, if you want to jot that down at your desk, there also is a type in um, your answer here box on the screen next to the poll if you'd like to put any of them there as well. Okay, it looks like at this point, Rob, that everyone has been able to answer the poll question. I have broadcast the results for you and ended it so you can see. Thank you. Yeah, so 63% were correct when they said false. Actually, any Department of Interior agency will be able to use roads. So uh, when, we, when it's moved to the what's called geo platform that'll host the whole road system, uh, each agency within the Department of Interior will have their own roads uh, plat or will have the same survey and uh, will have a portion of the ESRI uh, database set aside for their agency's data. So uh, Bureau of Land Management, it, it would be accessible to all their employees, for example, um, or Bureau of Reclamation. So the nice thing is, even though it was developed by SWS and NPS, all DOI uh, bureaus and agencies will have access to it because it sits uh, behind the firewalls of the Department of Interior on their geo platform server. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and at this time, we don't have any additional questions for you guys, so I'll move us back over to the presentation. So in closing for today's webinar, we hope that you have learned how to characterize the need for the DOI-wide animal vehicle collision data collection system, um, been able to describe the three phases of the project, identified how simple it is to use the road survey on a mobile device and the information that is gathered with the survey, demonstrated how the data collected through the road system can be analyzed and presented in reports and discovered ways to get involved in efforts to co-develop the National Animal Vehicle Collision Data Collection Standards. Um, in addition, I'd like to let you guys all know that our upcoming webinar series for the National Center for Rural Road Systems will be a, a Rural Road Safety Center will be a safe system for rural areas webinar series that we hope to begin either in May or June, and it will be uh, five to six webinars long, so be watching your email for information about when that webinar series will get started. As always, we do archive all of these webinars on our website, and you can find those there, including this one, which will be posted within the week um, with the PDF of the slides as well as the link to watch this again. Um, as Matt mentioned, as soon as the other documents for the road system are also available, we'll post them with it as well. And as I mentioned earlier, um, if you have any additional questions, you can feel free to reach out to both of our instructors, Robin and Matt Bell. Um, and you can also reach out to us at the National Center for Rural Road Safety. And those email addresses are now on your screen. Um, so again, for the person who is looking for the user manual, if you'd like to send an email so that we send that directly to you, um, we would be happy to do so. So we thank you all for joining us today, and I thank um, Rob and Matt for their time, and have a great afternoon. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks.